Salam Kun listeners, welcome back to another episode of Boys in the Cave. I'm your host Tanzim and today we're alhamdulillah joined by a very special guest and this is someone I actually wanted to have a conversation with um, and you guys will uh, know why. So Hizar Ali Mir is a teaching fellow at the University of Leeds. He's also a producer of Network Reorient and the co-founder of the Colonial Ki- uh, Kirat Khana group. Yeah. Um, he completed his PhD in t- 2018 in um, decolonizing the concepts of religion and secularism. Uh, his current interest is in the alt-right and traditionalism and how these ideas have impacted or seeped into the Islamicate. So, assalamu alaikum, uh, Hizar, and welcome to Boys in the Cave. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for having me. Anytime. Uh, I know it's a bit late um, where you're at. Um, I think <laughs> you you're, you live in Leeds, but alhamdulillah, thanks for coming on. I know it took some time to work. Uh, it's actually 7 a.m. here, so... Uh, we're all oh, okay. making sacrifices. Yeah. Like <laughs> at, the, at the separate ends of the day. So, yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, wow. prayed, Fajr and, prayed yeah. Fajr and came here and you probably uh, <laughs> the prayed Asha and yeah. joined Alhamdulillah. So, um, I wanted to, before we jump into the, I know we wanted to cover more on Alt Right because um, I've been following you on um, the group, um, the Facebook group, the Colonial yeah. Kirit Hana. Yeah. Um, and that's actually very kind of, uh, what can I put it? Because I guess uh, with Boys in the Cave um, doing this um, project, you kind of meet with uh, Muslims on different spectrums. And I think that group specifically, like mashallah, it's very kind of, uh, it wants to kind of elevate discourse, um, have good um, conversations. And it kind of uh, weeded out certain maybe, uh, it, that group sort of weeds out, I guess, certain um, factions in the community that seem to kind of jump into the whole anti-feminism, anti I don't know, anything to do with um, decolonial um, conversations because it seems, you know, un-Islamic to them. But alhamdulillah, like with that group, it's kind of fostering a sort of dialogue that's very um, unique and very fruitful, alhamdulillah. So um, could you touch on the Facebook group subjective in general, just for the audience that haven't really um, heard of it before? Okay. Um, To be honest, I think... uh when I and one of my friends, uh, Said Mustafa Ali, we basically um, started the group as a way of um, basically just publicizing conversations that were happening privately. Um, so as as far as the objectives of the group go, I know it's been around for quite a while now. Um, as far as Facebook groups go, I know there's a kind of up and down groups come and groups go. But alhamdulillah, we've stayed the course for this is the fourth year now, I believe, 2016. Uh, we founded it, and now it's 2020. So, yeah, four years. Um, I would say the objective of the group is basically to show um, the myriad of ways in which Muslims understand the decolonial. And I think we've <laughs> at least managed to uh, fulfill that particular objective. But I think the second objective, um, which to be honest, I think we need to work a bit more at, is bridging the divide between um, the academics and the activists. And that requires the invention of a certain type of language that isn't uh, too jargon-filled, which basically can be taken out of the uh, ivory tower of academia and basically brought to um, basically everybody, so it's accessible to everybody. You don't have to, you know, do this as your day job kind of thing. And obviously that's what it's all about at the end of the day because academics by themselves can't really do anything. Uh, we have to uh, bring the community in as stakeholders. So I think with that objective, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, but in terms of the first objective, I think we've more or less shown that there's a whole load of, of people who are interested in decolonizing. But from now, speaking from my own subjective point of view, I would suggest that not all decolonizations were made equal, as it were. Um, but obviously, that's my own opinion, and my own opinion will always be my own, and those shared, uh, those people who share it with me are, are welcome to share it with me, I guess. Um, so... Yeah, I'd say those are the two main objectives of the group. We've tried to expand it beyond just the Facebook group um, a number of times. Uh, but obviously, this would require work, which those who already have like full-time jobs, families, uh, other commitments, just simply can't 
do so but inshallah i hope there's some ideas in the pipe work that i've had uh, obviously i've been out of commission as well for a while because of my own uh situation but yeah i think and uh, in lieu of that we should be able to do something that goes just beyond the facebook group itself um, i think and actually, i guess um sorry one yeah, sorry, just to add um, one, because um, you're touching on uh, the idea of kind of um, bridging the gap between activists and um, academics. I guess one would say that one criticism that can be made of academics is that they speak in uh, terms that are may not be palatable for the um, sort of uh, common everyday folk um, people or even just um, lay Muslims in general. And um, um, I would you what what's your sort of take on that um perspective uh, i would agree i would agree completely and that's why i said like <laughs> okay. uh, i would agree completely um because obviously i have a, a very like my history in activism is actually a lot longer than my history in academia so my uh, parents bless them they um were part of uh, so, uh, amongst uh, part of some of the organizations which were amongst the first set up in britain like young muslims and isb and that kind of thing so obviously i've been going to islamic camp since i was about three years old um so my activism basically has informed a lot of my academia so to speak because obviously i've been part of these conversations on the ground where we've organized conferences we've organized events and then we've marketed them in a certain way and i've always been curious about the language that we use and how we describe islam and how we describe what it is and what it isn't and so obviously that's why the phd kind of came out of that organically where right is islam actually a religion what is secularism is it actually palatable for muslims and obviously in full disclosure um i actually went through a period where i was like a kind of ardent secularist from i think it was from like age 18 till about 21 when i started my masters yeah around about then 21 22 that's when i kind of um it was amazing because i sat down with my phd supervisor and i said oh like this thing about secularism there was always like a splinter in the back of my head always saying that oh there's something wrong with this but I couldn't quite grasp it. And obviously being taught by, you know, Professor Salman Said, who was my supervisor, he basically allowed me to take that splinter out of my head. So I always have him to thank for that. Um, yeah, I would say in terms of bridging the gap, um, there needs to be, and this is why I said, there needs to be an invention of a certain language, uh, a new set of parameters that make these grand ideas like actually we shouldn't call Islam a religion. We actually shouldn't be in favor of secularism because it's predicated on Islam being a religion, which it's not. So therefore, if Islam isn't a religion, what exactly are you splitting? If there's no religion, you can't split religion and state. So the whole thing kind of just falls like a, a trail of dominoes. But that needs to be explained in an easier way. and obviously. Pre uh, actually even previous to that you need to actually explain be able to explain to people what things like orientalism are why should we be concerned with orientalism what was orientalism how did that impact the most fundamental ways that we see uh islam and the islamic hate? like what did it do uh how did that trauma of the west knowing muslims and knowing islam what did that actually do to us and i think that's something which even in academia is a bit, uh, especially amongst muslim academics is quite underdeveloped i would say what, there's very i wanted to add um just because um you some of our audience may be a bit um confused because you're using terms like islamicate and uh, decol oh, okay. uh, decolonial yeah, see, would you be able to kind of define that I'm doing it myself. Just in a succinct way. <laughs> so ah, this okay. Is, yeah. This is this is the problem because I there needs to be a way of conveying these terms without then having to launch into a five to ten minute description of what they are. Do you see what I mean? Like there needs yeah, to be yeah. a way of making it snappy. 
So, for example, Definitely, one yeah. thing that I always uh, that one thing that I always think of is that back in the late '90s, early 2000s, when um, when uh, we were still doing the activism stuff, there were always these leaflets which would explain, you know, certain parts of Islam. And I always think that if we were to try to do that with the decolonial, that leaflet would be like a massive book, because there's no <laughs> yeah. shorthand way of explaining. So I'll try my best. So the decolonial to start off with that basically is the drive towards removing uh the colonization that the west imposed on us both physically so in terms of for example ne- these days it would be more like what you know as neo-colonialism so through debt through the imf etc cetera, etc cetera. but in the past it was you know through physical invasion uh you know the state taking over for example of egypt uh completely and obviously other muslim countries as well barring i think turkey and saudi arabia were the only ones who escaped it and but more importantly for us now i would argue that we need to decolonize intellectually and that's going to be a very very painful process because and i would argue that there's a lot of people who we considered to be major scholars now who are actually very much invested in keeping an oriental view of the islamic hate and then that nicely segues me into what is the islamic hate so the islamic hate islam distinction came from uh, a scholar of, of islamic history called marshall hodgson in his venture of islam um uh, trilogy i want to say but um yeah trilogy of books volume one two and three in the beginning of volume one he states that um, so Islam is the what he calls the religious aspects, and then the Islamic hate is everything that was built around that. Now, obviously, already we can see some problems with that, and I kind of tried to get around those in my theses. Um, that's still something that I'm working on because I'm not too happy with how I do it in my theses. But yeah, that's basically the Islam Islamic hate distinction that Islam is the higher ethics or principles. Um, Actually, yeah, you could just basically get rid of the religious and say Islam is the higher ethics and principles of uh, the Muslim. And then the Islamic hate is everything that's built around those ethics and principles. So that's the decolonial and the Islamic hate. Okay. And um, you mentioned um, also um, slightly before that, that um, is, is Islam a religion? I think for a lot of like lay people, they'll be like, super confused or even you don't even have to be late it's like yeah like you know religion is something that i believe in and follow um why would it be um you know wh- why, why would you say that it's not religion because um we actually did an episode with um uthman Badr. so uh, okay. would you say that um because we actually asked him actually sorry we asked him a question in terms of certain words we use in language uh, yeah. when it comes to um, defining our Islam. And one of the examples he actually gave was about um, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, where he mentioned um, the whole idea of, was it ideology? Like how using the word ideolo- um, ideology is a problem because um, it has some roots and um, it uh, it kind of narrows down what Islam is, whereas um, he uh, what Uthman said is that in the same sentence or same um, speech, he uses the word Islam and religion. And would you say that... Um, Religion is kind of defined very specifically, maybe perhaps in a more internal manner where you just have a set of beliefs and keep it to yourself. And that's how religion is defined. And that's why maybe pigeonholing Islam into that sort of um, word or framework is problematic. Would you say is is that why you're saying that is um, proposing the question that um, why is or if sorry, if Islam is a religion, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I would actually say that's exactly uh, correct. I would argue that the secular is what defined the religious and what it is and its place. And um, to be quite frank and quite honest, Islam will have no truck with that. Islam is not a religion. Uh, religion is something that you simply keep to yourself. And it makes sense that Hamza Yusuf would want to keep Islam as a religion, given his uh well, how can I put this? His political views, <laughs> shall we say. Mm. Um, so I would argue, and obviously I'm not the only one you've also mentioned, Uthman Badr, and there's others, that Islam is something that goes beyond simply a religion. Now, obviously, again, like the group on Facebook, there's many different views of what 
uh, Islam then can be. Okay, and obviously we each have our own, like in terms of academics and what have you, and the people who are into this stuff. But then I would argue that one thing that comes out of it seems like a small thing where you say, oh, Islam isn't a religion. Okay, let's move on now. We've just basically renamed it as something else. But it actually has a massive knock-on effect depending upon what you um, describe it as. It can have a massive knock-on effect on how you actually see what Islam is and how you actually see it moving forward, as in, to borrow the term from the West, I guess, progress, as it were. Yeah? However we define progress, obviously we're going to recapture that word and basically make it into an Islamic hit term, and then we define our own progress, so to speak. So I would argue, yeah, you've basically got the nail on the head. It's the secular that defines the religious and then sets itself against the religious. Yeah? Yeah. And, and this, is, this, is the, yeah. this is the great uh, de- deception at the heart of secularism, is that it's rigged the game before you, the game even starts. Yeah, mm. it's like getting. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good analogy. Like, yeah, yeah, it's like getting uh, a defendant to go over, to preside as judge over their own case, because the secular defines the religious, but then it pretends to be neutral and say, "Oh, actually, this is religious. I'm secular, and now we've got a split. Therefore, we're neutral." Yeah, this isn't the case at all. And for anyone, for example, like Osman, who's uh, read into the history of this, and I would suggest that there's an excellent uh, work, Before Religion, by Brent non Uh He actually has a small section on uh, Islam and what it used to say about deen and the word deen and how he basically compares uh, translations of the Quran from like the 15th century and then the 18th century to show how even European understandings of what deen meant had changed over the course of the development of religion as a concept. So it's quite interesting to see that. Uh, But I would highly recommend that work uh, to your listeners before religion by Brent on Gibri. Uh, It's quite good. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's hard to as like perhaps like Muslims in this um, day and age where you're sort of like for me, when I uh, grew up, for example, you just, assume that islam is just like something personal personal belief and everyone can kind of have their own personal like everyone can have their personal beliefs but that's why islam is and that's how you've defined it but then subhanallah like even like example in the seerah when russell's son passes away we have um i think abu Bakr says it to uthman or uthman says it to abu Bakr. i forgot but he's like um uh, when russell son passed away and they need like someone to a, a new leader a caliph is like um they were confused if should we fixate ourselves about, you know, the burial of Rasulullah some? But then I think Uthman uh, Radian who mentioned that, you know, we uh, Islam needs saving, right? So to use mm-hmm. Islam in that context, it clearly means it's a political um, move, right? But okay. in that, in saying that, it's like encapsulating the idea that you're protecting Islam, but on a political front, which we would actually, sorry, we, what we would define as political front today is, you know, having a caliph um, standing in like the Ottoman Empire, for example, but we know um, Uthman right, the one who used that, um, used Islam in that context of politics, which means that you can infer from that that um, politics is within Islam, right? It's not mm. like it's not separate, if you get what I mean. So, I guess that's just one example of the many that you can find um throughout the course of our history when it comes to the idea that politics and religion isn't like separate and i guess like martin luther had a big role in that as well mm. uh, there's there's a lot of history with that so i guess because. for us muslims it's about like I, it kind of ties in with decolonial as well it's to get to the yeah. root of like our our tradition not be sort of um phased by uh, the ideologies that exist in today that may inform our religion or our islam or our tradition so but the thing is one thing that i would be careful of and obviously i am and now obviously my own uh, opinion of what the decolonial should be and again this is obviously shared it's not just something that i'm coming up with i'll be sure to say when it's just something i'm coming up with is that looking into the or like you say getting to the root of our tradition shouldn't mean that we're scared to take from other traditions when necessary okay and i would argue that it's actually a massive part of our tradition to take from other traditions for example the political systems of the early caliphs were persian and byzantine 
like the civil servants remain the same. I would argue that in the intellectual scene, there's a lot of uh, fiqh and even, well, mostly the philosophers and some Sufis who are highly influenced by Greek philosophy. When you take something from a position of power, and now shout out to my uh, co-founder, Said Musfali, for inspiring this point. Um, when you take something from a position of power, it's okay then to take. And I would suggest that Muslims need to be more confident these days in order to be able to take from others from a position of power. Okay, it's a confidence issue. You need to be able to say, I'm taking this from you, but I'm repurposing it. An example, we've been talking about politics. I would argue that it's actually impossible to not be political. It's impossible to not be political because the political rests upon the distinction between the friend and the enemy. Okay, as soon as you have a friend and an enemy, you've entered the political. So even those who claim to be apolitical or who used to claim apoliticalness, I don't think they can anymore with a straight face given the uh, governments that they're causing up to. This is still a political position. You have friends who are apolitical with you and you have enemies, usually the so-called Islamists, whatever that means. Um there's no getting away from that. Anyone who says they're not political is lying, basically, or they don't know they don't know what they're talking about. Essentially, um, there is you have to be political. It's it's in human nature to be political. We always need reassurance and validation from an in group as opposed to an out group. Yeah, the basis of all of this is difference. So, yeah. I think um, even just the idea of, um, I think sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that Islam is just, you know, I've had this conversation with a lot of people, even online, offline as well. Yeah. Um, the idea that Islam is sort of this, all these Islamic knowledge we say or anything to do with Islam is this in, in, in this nice little bubble um, and everything outside it is like un-Islamic, right? It's, pro- but it's I guess, uh, profane. Uh, it, Exactly, yeah. and if anything, like we should see all knowledge as sort of Islamic anyway. Yeah, it's, of course. You know, this is, from this Allah, is, right? This is exactly, and the Prophet said, so, so, um, if you so, uh, so, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave, seek knowledge even if it's chi- in China. I would argue that this thing about, you know, Islamic knowledge, yeah, this is self-secularization. This is internalized colonization is what it is, because how can you have Islamic knowledge that would mean everything else is quote unquote secular or profane. It's self uh, secularization. It's self colonization. Now, obviously, this poses problems for the vanguards of the tradition, who basically want um, the tradition to be kept in within the confines of certain places, okay, madrasas and stuff like that. But that's just simply not going to happen anymore. Uh, that world is gone, and it should never have been there in the first place to be honest, because it's a byproduct of Western Orientalism. And again, things like this, which are a byproduct of the West's imposition on uh, Islam, most people take for granted that, yes, you go if you go to a madrasa, you're more Islamically valid than if you study at a university. No, it's just simply not the case. Um, because what exactly do these places have that a university-trained uh, Islamic studies scholar doesn't have? No, there is no, and when you ask this question, there's an answer sort of like, oh, but you know, they're in this sacred space, and it's kind of like they're sitting at the feet of a sheikh, and he's passing on his light and stuff like that to them. And I'm like, well, are you basically arguing that all academics are dead spiritually? Which again, <laughs> it's basically, it's basically it's just opens a whole can of worms, which it's like a snake eating itself. And this is what self-colonization is. But again, like I said at the beginning, there are people who are invested in keeping the colonized Islam afloat. And this uh, this is a war that's going on at the moment. And I would actually argue that it is an intellectual war that is going on at the moment uh, between these two sides. 
Yeah, it's it's a long conversation, and I guess there's so much to unpack when it comes to those um, sort of uh, discussions and dialogues. I want to uh, I wanted to sort of touch more um, to shift the conversation a little yeah. bit to touch on more about the kind of um, alt right uh, phenomenon because I know you've um, looked into a lot. You've actually done a podcast on network reorient, if yeah. I recall, on on the yeah. subject. And I went through. I I listened through it much. It's very insightful because I feel that um, as Muslims, I haven't really seen too much works on that sort of whole phenomena. Mm. Um, and it's a lot to kind of unpack because it's a people may say that perhaps it is sort of. Um, implicitly or maybe even explicitly sort of tying in with the sort of um, right-wing governments that are getting into mm. power around the world. So this sort of group, it may um, have sort of flow and effects in terms of how things are conducted in this day and age. So it'd be sort of good to kind of unpack it um, and see where the converse- conversation goes when it comes to the all rights phenomena specifically. Um, I wanted to ask you to just kick it off um what is the all right for people who may not be aware? Because I feel that when I sort of got into the more maybe Twitter space, mm. people sort of throw through the term around a lot. And this was like a while back when I was like first on the Twitter. And then I had to kind of research and know, find out like what it is actually like. Because I guess perhaps um, what I found is that normal day-to-day kind of Muslim, you know, uh, prays, goes to work, comes back, doesn't really have an idea or have no idea about this group. So would you be able to kind of um, briefly uh, summarize who the alt-right is and perhaps even just a little bit of the history of how they came about? Okay. Um, I would say that the alt-right are um, hmm, a massive conglomeration of various groupings which have found that their interests align on various uh, issues, okay? So the alt-right today is made up of a whole host of groupings which have different things as their focus, but they agree with everything in the overarching kind of um, project. So you have those alt-righters whose main focus is Islam and getting rid of Muslims and immigrants. Then you have those alt-righters whose main focus is anti-feminism, so men going their own way, the incels, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have those uh, alt-righters who are more interested in, for example, setting up their own ethno-nationalist state. So why ethno-nationalist state uh, stretching from Spain all the way to Serbia, as Richard Spencer put it. So all of these groupings have found that their interests somewhat align, and they've basically come together and create this amorphous mass, which we know as the alt-right. Um, obviously, there is, uh, with any grouping, of course, even if it's made up of loads of little grouping, there's a history to this. So I guess the alt-right's history, I don't like putting origin points on things, because obviously things have a history to get to the origin point even, um, just like obviously the prophet himself basically had, you know, uh, the other prophets to, you know, he was the seal of prophethood. He didn't just appear out of nowhere kind of thing. Um, So I would suggest that as if you were to give it a starting point, I would say 2007 would be the starting point where Richard Spencer uh who's a really famous alt right who's kind of faded from prominence now uh, for various reasons um mainly due to the fact of the failure of his own online platforms um but he coined the term alternative right now the alt right basically styles itself and sells itself on the premise that current conservatives So, for example, the Conservative Party in the UK and the Republicans in the US are not upholding conservative values properly. Okay, or they've given in to what uh, the alt right call the liberal consensus. Okay, and this is why uh, one of the most famous articles uh, explaining what the alt right is is written by two alt writers. who are alt writers themselves. Milo Yiannopoulos, who you uh, listeners may know of. Uh, Milo, he's quite well known. I think he, did he get banned from Australia when he wanted to give a book? Yeah, uh, I, think, I yeah. think so. Yeah, I yeah. remember something happened. Yeah. 
so him and uh, Alun Bukhari. Yes, there are a lot of uh, former Muslims part of this thing, to be honest. Um, so they wrote an article, The Establishment Conservatives Guide to the Alt-Right. So in the beginning, they were very much talking to those who are already conservative. That look, these your leaders have basically abandoned you. They've sold you out to all these immigrants and stuff like that. Come join us and we'll give you the true conservatism, the true right-wing experience, so to speak. And this process of doing this, they called red pilling. Okay, showing you the truth of the world as it was. And obviously this comes from uh, the Matrix where Morpheus hands Neo the red and blue pill. Do you want to go back to sleep in the fake world or do you want to come and see what the real world is like? And then after Richard Spencer, to go back to my history, after Richard Spencer, you basically have a whole host of incidences where it seems like there's a growing contingent of people online who are spreading vitriol and basically doing things which we wouldn't consider to be ethical. So, for example, the biggest uh, example of this, and which today is still the biggest example of this, is the Gamergate scandal in which uh, uh, two journalists, uh, Zoe Quinn and Anita Sarkeesian, were basically pointing out the sexism in video games, and they basically got attacked. Uh, Zoe Quinn got doxxed, which basically means that her address, her kids' school, her where her partner worked, where she worked, all of that got leaked online with a basic wink, wink, you know what to do kind of thing. Um, I think the same happened to Anita Sarkeesian as well. And this was basically all... Um, directed and coordinated by what I like to call the biggest hive of scum and villainy on earth, 4chan. 4chan being a forum where everyone posts anonymously and you can post whatever the hell you like, basically. There are no rules, there are no limits. Everything is up for grabs. There's been uh, school shootings in America where the shooter has written on 4chan the day before, if you go to the school, don't, don't go in tomorrow. This is the kind of thing that we're dealing with with these uh, people. So this kind of happened. And then the Harambe incident, I don't know how many of your follow uh, listeners will know about the gorilla who basically was shot dead because there was a child that fell into his encampment. Um, the family of that child were harassed. There were nasty messages put on the grave of the child and nasty messages sent to the voicemail recording of the family themselves. There was a whole host of things. This all culminated basically in 4chan helping to get Trump elected president. Okay? And the power and force of 4chan and the Daily Stormer and places like this were felt even by Hillary Clinton, where she basically referred to 4chan in one of her speeches and uh, called them deplorables, or I'm trying, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, it was something like deplorables. I can't remember exactly what she said, but she definitely called them, you know, this is a swamp of deplorables. So that's basically what you get with the alt right. You get this mash of anti feminist, trad tra um, traditional life loving, um, like real conservatives, real in quotations. This is what the all right basically is. I think um, there's a lot to unpack. I think uh, in terms of um, maybe a user in a con maybe I can ask you a question in terms of um, the context of how certain perhaps Muslim figures uh, may discuss certain subjects because um, some people um, as Muslims will be like yeah like I'm anti-feminist because you know uh, feminism is X Islam's Y. Um, it, Islam isn't necessarily for pro feminism. So when there's that, that's one point. And then um, the whole because you mentioned ethno white state, um, mm. people will be like, you know, there's a khilafah. So there's a it's maybe not a white state per se, but Islam do have um, they do have like a state 
in in the sense that in in politically speaking, you know, um, Islam, uh, uh, the Khilaf will be ruled by a caliph and etc. So in that sense, we're sort of, you know, close to the all right. So we're anti-feminist. We're mm. sort of um, for an Islamic state sort of thing. And so, are we? Are we for an Islamic uh, state? Like, though? like in the. It, okay, that's 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 what I'm saying. Like that's what some thing, people may say. You know what I mean? But the, but the thing is, what's the again the notion of state? Where did the notion of state come from? The nation state. Where did that come from? From I guess the Europeans. So yeah, actually. exactly. So now again, you're self colonizing. Muslims are very yeah, good yeah. at this. <laughs> They're very good at self-colonizing. Yeah, we want to. But then, what does that mean exactly? Are you going to have all the apparatuses of a modern state? Are you going to, you know, be totalitarian in certain ways? Are you going to watch your citizens constantly, like certain states do? Like, what what does this mean? Why do we want a nation that, state? That that's like a whole kind of rabbit hole of a conversation. But in terms of, I guess, in terms of um, aligning with more um, the alt right, like that's that's what people would say in order to say that we're actually closer to the alt right rather than the left because okay. the left they have you know I don't know um, homosexual acts are permissible and gay love and etc. You get what I mean? So why, they make why do that we have distinction. to? Why, why do we have to be close to either? See, this is the poverty of like um, not having our own way, and I would argue that basically, yeah, you're right. Like, obviously, I'm tr- stepping on the toes of something that I wanted to mention later on. But um, when we talk about what I call the alt wallas, those who basically have taken on the ideas of the alt right but given an Islamic spin to them, they have their lefty equivalents, who I call the MSJWs, the Muslim social justice warriors who basically take on the liberal West kind of manifesto and push it. So you basically have these two sides and then everyone else is kind of caught in the middle, listening to them bicker kind of thing with no kind of way out of this situation. Apart from, I would argue, the decolonial, which basically says to both sides, you need to stop, you need to think, and we need to develop another way out of this quagmire that we found ourselves in. So, yeah. That's basically what people, I would say. So, but however, some people will say that um, the concepts that we use, like uh, for example, decolonial and all that, may be uh, more of a left-leaning sort of um, ideology. Uh, not ideology, like those kind of concepts are from the left. So, you're just saying that yes, you know, we shouldn't be closer to either the right or the left. But you're actually using concepts that are more from the left. So you're sort of not uh, you're unknowingly sort of aligning more with the left than the right if that makes sense okay i would argue like i did previously that going back to the roots of our tradition does not necessarily mean that we eschew taking things from certain people okay i would argue that since like what 99 percent of the muslim world went underwent colonization it would be prudent to uh, take on decolonization. I think, like I said before, I think only Turkey and Saudi Arabia escaped it. And then even then, Turkey had Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who was uh, the in-house colonizer par excellence, to be honest. Um, So I would argue that there's a difference between taking Jordan Peterson and taking the decolonial. And for those who can't see that, I worry for them, (laughs) to be honest, Um, because one is a rabid Islamophobe and the other can basically help us get out of a situation that we find ourselves in where the main intellectual streams of of like like what you said, the common Muslims are caught between uh, are caught in the West's culture wars, I would say, actually. That's basically what it is. We're essentially caught in the culture wars of the West. Now, just because the decolonial is a leftist um, concept doesn't necessarily mean we can't use it to create something else. Okay? There's a difference, I would argue, between something that is integral to the project of what my um, teacher, Professor Salman Said, calls Westernese, which is the West's project to basically explain everything around it and to dominate it, there's a difference between a concept that belongs to Westernese 
and a concept which tries to undo Westernese. I would argue that the decolonial is a concept that tries to undo Westernese. Okay? And obviously, for those who are familiar with the history of the decolonial would know, that it actually doesn't start within Europe at all. Its main purveyors are those of South America who are also colonized. Um, for them, the big date is 1492, when obviously Granada fell, and then Columbus uh, went over to the Americas and started basically the process of colonization. Obviously, for us, it would be um, the uh, 1792, is it? Oh, God, it's gone completely on my head. When Napoleon invaded uh, Egypt, that would be the start of uh, colonization for us, um, simply because it was the first time that the Muslims sat up and thought, oh, God, what, what's going on here? We've been defeated. Egypt is gone. It's under the control of the French. 1798, that's when it was. Yeah, uh, it's just coming back to me. I'm getting old. Um, so I would argue that there's certain things that can be used by the Muslims in order to advance their own projects. But there's certain things where if you argue, well, if you're using that, I can use this. They're simply, they're not equal. One has a, spa has a place in how the West dominates you, and the other is used to free you. These are not equal by any stretch of the imagination. What do you mean by the West dominates you? Are you saying um, in the context of um, if the right or people, uh, Muslims are more right-leaning, um, they use concepts? Would you say that when they do, do that, they're more in, uh, implicitly or maybe explicitly sort of propagating the idea that the West should dominate you? Is that what you're saying? Well, yes, because if you use right-leaning ideas, what are they? If you look at the alt-right, what is the alt-right? It's simply a reaction to the decolonial. It's a reaction to losing ground to the decolonial, to the uppity, uh, to the uppity, you know, engine, as it were, the uppity native who's now coming up with ideas of his own or her own. This is what the uh, alt-right is a reaction to, I would argue. Mm. And you can see that because they basically, so for example, one of the main articles uh, that I first read when I was looking into the alt-right was um, an article about this alt-right meme, uh, which is white Sharia. So they want a white Sharia. Now, what is white Sharia? White Sharia is a very anti-feminist um, meme, um, uh, which basically was started by Sacco Vandal, uh, who was uh, uh, behind an alt-right podcast. I think it was called The War Room. And this basically took off, and he basically wrote uh, a piece in what I would call the intellectual alt-right's main uh, blog, the Countercurrents Publishing blog, in which he writes that, um, and I'm actually trying to get if I can find the, um, I want to see if I can find, right, we should never forget that Faustian man was once not so long ago the most vicious and barbaric player on the world stage. Oswald Spengler referred to early Western man as the red-haired barbarian of Frankistan. Whites did not conquer the entire earth by being nice or civilized. Whites conquered the world by sailing into foreign lands and taking these lands by force. Vikings, crusaders, and conquistadors alike were all practitioners of rape, pillage, and plunder. So these are the people you want to take from, yeah? Like, it's just, it's just, it's common sense. Like, you know, you don't take from these people don't want um, to help you. And if you take from them, you're self-colonizing. Like, to the extent at which it's, it's amazing. So hang on. Ah, here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I'm just trying to find. Ah, here you go. But what they do say, the alt-right, and actually they use what they perceive to be our Sharia in service of their um, goals. So just to quote again from the uh, piece, I don't like Muslims, but if they had invented the wheel, I would have no qualms about stealing it from them. If our enemies are in possession of a superior weapon, i.e. patriarchy, he said previously that Muslims are the only uh, nation left on earth that practices extreme patriarchy. So if our enemies are in possession of a superior weapon, it is our duty 
in the name of the survival of our race to steal that weapon from them and use it against them. One must fight fire with fire. Yeah. <laughs> oh this my is, goodness. This is. Uh, so, I would uh, highly suggest that your reader, uh, that your listeners, read this article. It's called "In Defense of White Sharia" by Sako Vandal, and it really brings home what their view of Islam is and how they wish to even use uh, Islam against or, or Islam in quotations against the Muslims. Because they basically believe, obviously, it's the old Oriental uh, stereotype that, oh, they're outbreeding us kind of thing. So now we should practice an extreme form of patriarchy where women are kept in the house and we basically uh, force them to have lots of children so we're not basically replaced. Yeah, and this is the idea of the white genocide, linking into the white genocide that immigrants are coming here and they're going to replace us, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I would argue that people who are intent on your domination cannot help you. I think um, in terms of, because uh, we're we're talking more about the alt-right, there are perhaps Muslims, like not to take more extreme example, more to the fact that, okay, um, because people would say that these alt-right sort of ideologies aren't actually prevalent through the common sort of uh, folk in the West, because even, I guess, as you mentioned, the alt-right would view that, you know, the society is becoming more liberalized, which is a problem, I guess. Mm. And um, some people, some Muslim figures would say that um, we need to be more sort of working in the government to sort of um, better the conditions uh, for Muslims in the West. And we need to uh, align with perhaps Christians that are more pro-family values because we see um, an increase of LGBTQ and that's seen as un-Islamic and et cetera because it's haram. Uh, So uh, in terms of the actual homosexual act, um, so that's why um, having these sort of views, they might not be... um, exactly in the alt-right spectrum but they're more perhaps you could say leaning towards um the right and they don't seem to trust i guess people like bernie sanders um who are running for um Mm. and government and all that would you say that they sort of okay so because let's just we have this case study of this muslim um figure would you say that they're more perhaps not in exactly in the spectrum of perhaps the alt-right that there may be Maybe it's like a discussion that we can have between them, um, but they may be more right-leaning rather than left. Or would you say that perhaps their ideas are more of a product of what the alt-right are perpetuating? So what what's your sort of... Because I think that most... I think a lot of Muslims would more align with uh, people such as that or that are propagating that sort of um, uh, rhetoric, if that makes sense. So mm. what's your sort of take on that? I would... Hmm... I would say, first of all, and this is obviously pointing to a wider problem, and it's something that I've mentioned before, that I don't think Muslims should measure themselves based on a spectrum that was invented elsewhere, that has other concerns at the heart of it, like this right-left thing. Um, But again, that speaks to the poverty of um, Islamic political options, as it were. Um, Why couldn't this uh, theoretical figure put forward um, an Islamic way? uh like um i'd hate to use this um phrase because it's been used a lot but we could call it the third way as it were kind of thing um so that would be my first point that we don't actually need to do this but obviously being in reality and we are in the situation where people are aligning themselves according to this spectrum i would argue that let's Let's keep to the theme of reality. The theme of reality is that if you align with the right currently, you're with Trump and Boris Johnson. Trump and Boris Johnson are not exactly sympathetic to Muslim ideas or experiences, even those that they work with. So, for example, Sajid Javed, and even uh, before that, and even more explicitly, Baroness Varsi uh, in the UK who both part of the Conservative Party and Baroness Varsi wrote about the Islamophobia in her own party, this is the kind of thing that you will find. You will not be accepted by the right because you are enemy number one. Okay? And it's interesting to note that the vanguard or the leaders of this uh, move towards the right for Muslims 
all share the same pigment, to put it bluntly. Yeah? There's no figures or leaders that I can think of off the top of my head that are calling for an alliance with the right, which that who are who come from certain parts of the world originally. Okay? Or if they do, they're being uh, basically attacked as, so for example, one of my good uh, friends on Facebook, uh, Hakeem Mohammed, has written amply about uh, what Zaytuna and Zayd Shakir and Hamza Yusuf are doing. And obviously your listeners can go and see his posts. I would highly recommend you follow him. He's a very interesting uh, chappy, and I would highly recommend his work to everybody. But it's interesting to see where alignments are coming from and where people are being sponsored from. So like if we were again to go into reality rather than hypothetical situations, those who are calling for an alliance with the right currently, especially in the US and even the UK, are all aligned with certain governments from the Middle East. And it would be in their interests to keep governments in the US and the UK happy. So I would suggest that we need to actually go beyond simply, this isn't simply a, how can I put this, a theological disputation. It's a political one. And again, how Muslims frame this is very important because to say that um, this apolitical kind of move to the right is a theological issue or a religious issue is, again, you're self-colonizing. You're basically splitting off your religion from your politics as it were, or the political. So I would suggest that this um, hypothetical doesn't really work. You need to bring it back to reality. And the reality is, is that for those who wish to be at the table when it comes to the right, will find themselves to be ostracized by the community, which means that their words will come to nothing. and B, Eventually, the right will get sick of you if you're saying the right things. I think just to also add in um, from my experience and from what I've experienced uh, on the ground, uh, CVE um, projects have more been propagated by the right wing think tanks, and we know how detriment it has it it can be. Um, we actually, um, sorry, yeah. Yeah, same in the UK. Um, the right wing, so CVE in the UK is Prevent. And I have a really good friend who uh, is uh, currently doing a PhD, uh, Claudia Radivan, who is talking about, uh, who's doing a thesis on Prevent, and she's done many talks on that um, issue, where basically most of the supporters of Prevent are the more right wing, and you're having people... Um, certain groupings of Muslims who, again, are completely ostracized by the community, have literally no standing amongst the mainstream Muslim community in the UK, who support them as basically their go-to Muslim figures. Yeah, mm. this, is, this is the situation that you have with the right wing. If you get into bed with the right wing, you're going to be a token. You're going to be their, uh, oh, we're not racist, we have this guy. And we see that with uh, Candace Owens, like literally right now, with how she's yeah. being propped up because she's black and she's talking about more empowerment and self-help and all that. But that kind yeah, of, of um, takes away from the idea of the actual structural racism that um, occurs in institutions. Yeah, it's, of course. And then if she's, against, she's you... against climate change as well, which is really weird. <laughs> yeah. So all these like whack positions. Of course, if you get into bed with the uh, with the right wing and with Trump, it is you're getting into bed with the alt right. You can't really critique any of these structures which are oppressing the Muslims. So if you get into bed with Trump, what are you going to say against his Muslim ban? Can you say mm. anything against his Muslim ban? Would you say the alt right? So I guess the more um the the um token figure or token leader is Donald Trump. Would you say that's the case? Um, I wouldn't say he's their leader. I'd say he's their. They call him their prophet. Um, so there's a branch of the alt right which basically has this meme, Kekistan. So there's this fictional nation called Kekistan, which basically was around about two thousand years ago, in modern Iraq. Yeah, Mesopotamia. And it was surrounded by Normistan, who are Normie people. Normies is the uh, alt right term for normal people. 
and Kukistan. So Kukistan uh, is full of what would they would call the Cook Servatives. Now, Cook Servatives is the term that they give to those conservatives who have given in to the liberal agenda, like I mentioned earlier. They've been cuckolded, basically, is what they're trying to say. Um, then Normistan and Kukistan invaded, and then uh, Keki, Kekistanis became immigrants. They became refugees. And so it's a basically a play on what they believe is like, you know, the uh, goods and services which are just sprayed or, um, or given to refugees because they're immigrants. They're like, well, we're immigrants as well. Can we have all of this? Okay. It's kind of a sick parody based on an assumption that immigrants basically get all the jobs, they get the housing, they get the social benefit. And so these basically indigenous uh, white folk are basically, and it's not always white, there's obviously a mixture, um, but mostly white, are saying, well, we, we're immigrants now as well. Can we have all of these free you know, social security and all of this sort of stuff? Um, so I would suggest that that meme has a lot of impact on what we would kind of see as the alt-right's view on the vast, well, not just refugees, but Muslims in general. And so I would say that calling, to come back to the original point, to calling uh, Trump their leader doesn't really count for much. Because they pride themselves on being leaderless. But like I said, with the Kekistani thing, Trump is seen as the prophet of their God. So Kek is their God. So they even take from the Islamicate there, actually. This is something I should mention. If you look at the videos on YouTube about the Kekistani religion, they pray like Muslims do. They pray on prayer mats. Their holy book is basically um, has patterns on it like you would recognize from a Quran. Uh, they have the Aya Lollas, who are the religious heads of this religion. And basically, Trump is seen as the prophet of the Kekistanis who will come and unite all of the Kekistanis and allow them to basically take back what was theirs. That's who Trump is. I guess, <laughs> well, the, um, I guess it's more kind of uh, about preserving that um, white sort well, of, of course, ethnic that's all it's state in, that's all in the it's West. About. So it kind of stems back to that and that um, these immigrants are sort of invading our lands, so um, they should be perhaps um, eradicated. So I guess when it comes to those sort of Muslim bans or whatever, the travel mm. bans, they're always for it because that's sort of um, perhaps what they want and they feel that, they. I guess they prioritize, it just comes down to, I guess, racism, right? Like, yeah, but the thing is, there's certain Muslim scholars who have reinforced this. So, for example, uh, Hamza Yusuf saying straight after 9-11, if you don't like the West, leave. And this is on record. There's Guardian articles about this. And there are people who bought it up after he said what he said about uh, Black Lives Matter in 2016, that people were like, well, actually, he's been like this for a while, and you guys have just noticed now. And obviously, the remarks that were made uh, in Britain by a certain scholar who's name escapes me, uh, about that the, uh, Britain is in a curry island. Yeah? These are things which have been said by established Muslim scholars. Mm. Why have they been said? Is this what a right-leaning Muslim wants? Is this what they're doing? So, I again, guess, again uh, when, uh, like, you, when you get yeah, in bed sorry? with those who dominate you or want to dominate you, um, it's not going to lead to very good results. But just as, and again, I don't want to put across the message that I'm all for the opposite as well, the MSJWs to go full lefty. I don't want to do that either. The thing that we need is a new option. And that is, I would suggest, uh, able to be, um, or the condition of its possibility, what makes it possible, I would suggest, is the decolonial, is to basically shift through what's been added to Islam uh, or imposed on Islam, I should say, not added, imposed on Islam uh, through Western colonization and see what we can, what we need to get rid of. And I would argue it's the vast majority uh, of it. But then what will come out of that will probably be something which not a lot of people who are right-leaning will want or recognize. 
Because um, we, we're, we're using uh, Sheikh Hamza as an example. Would you say that like he's not like the argument is, can be made is that I think the context of him saying, you know, if you have a problem, then leave is in the fact that uh, we're so perhaps critical of the government, but they actually perhaps um, with their policies and all that do assist, I guess, Muslims that are in the West. So if you're just overly critical about the Western government uh, in the in how they, I don't know, have some sort of foreign policies without actually um, looking at the good that they may do um, in the West, um, then perhaps in that context, he may have said, you know, um, if you have an issue, then leave. Wouldn't you say that isn't as bad as compared to perhaps how we may be portraying as fully? He's just kind of pro, uh, right, and you know, uh, for for me, all the values that to do with the right. You, you get what I mean? To be quite frank, that's easy to say for a white guy. So, <laughs> I have no idea. I, I that, that's not to my end. Go down that road. That's yeah, my end of that. That's the end of that <laughs> response, to be honest. Um, I think it's quite ridiculous uh, to say something like that when you have statistics on racism in the US, you have statistics on racism in the UK about how hard it is for ethnic minorities who are actually pigmented to get jobs. Um, that's just ridiculous. Um, easy to say for a white guy is my response. I think like the like he is... You know, like, and I have a lot of appreciation for um, Hamza Yusuf, but wouldn't you say that, like, it's just maybe too harsh of an analysis, maybe? Because he, we know that the Muslim world is, like, n- not necessarily, like, you know, um, majority white, right? It's more, yeah. you know, brown, black, for example. Um, so, isn't that, like, he has, like, him being a, a, a leader in the Muslim community, wouldn't you say that he's not necessarily going to kind of, He's going to be more considerate than how we, how you may kind of portray him right now, in the sense that you know it's easy for a white guy that he knows that there's certain responsibilities, and maybe he's just um, no, he doesn't. Uh, more got it, got it wrong. No, he. Anyone, anyone who knew his responsibilities would not make the remarks that he made about Black Lives Matter. No, anyone who had any ounce of knowledge, understanding of what it means to be an ethnic minority in the US and the UK would not have got on that stage in 2016 and made those remarks. I think, um, I guess we'll we'll have to sort of agree to disagree in that sense. Because I Um, I personally don't think like he's explicitly trying to um, work. Like, I'm I'm sure he's aware of the responsibilities that he has because we know, you know, mm -mm. his efforts. Again, if any, if someone can get on the stage and say that oh black on black crime is a worse thing than white on black crime and everyone's crying about police brutality they have no understanding of what it means to be an ethnic minority absolutely okay, zero sorry. without we'll have to, any yeah. qualification <laughs> but uh, we can agree to disagree on that one but yeah, i would suggest I that is. anyone who's actually looked at any studies or looked at the history of racism in the US and the UK and the wider West, or even current statistics, never mind history, they just wouldn't make those remarks. It wouldn't it wouldn't be in the realm of possibility even for those remarks to come out of somebody's mouth who's looked at those things. Um, I want to also ask you. In, sorry, go on. Go on, go on. Sorry, sorry, go. On. No, I because uh, a lot earlier you mentioned, um, and I forgot to sort of um touch on the point about uh Jordan Peterson because yeah. um I don't like I want to get your thoughts about him and his relation to perhaps maybe the right or the all right because some people would say that you know they read his books and they're like you know he's trying to make you a better human being, taking initiative, um you know taking full accountability, um trying to make the best out of your life essentially. Uh so how can he perhaps? Because I think you alluded to that he's sort of um what do you call it anti-Islamic? I think that's what you mm. mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um. So some people may be confused because I know a lot of Muslims are like for his ideas and all that, and uh, more on the realm of you know he's um helped uh, sh- uh shaping up their their personal lives um to do to be the best they can be essentially. So they may be a bit you know confused like why would um this guy here paint him as sort of anti-Islamic? So, what's your sort of take on that? Why do you need Jordan Peterson? Yeah, isn't, it, Muhammad, uh, isn't Muhammad ibn Abdullah good enough? <laughs> <Subhanallah>. <laughs> uh, 
So, like, I mean, <laughs> like, hang on a minute. What are we doing here? So Jordan Peterson tells you to tidy up your room and you do it. What about cleanliness is half a faith? How did we miss that, Hadith? So, <laughs> but this I guess is, this like, is, it's more, this I is think the, the perspective. This is the ridiculousness of self-colonization where you take uh, Jordan Peterson's word over that of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself. Why so, so. can't you look at him? The Uswat and Hasana, the perfect example, as he's described in the Quran. I think people will be coming more from the perspective of like he's writing in like our context and when he's speaking more about those sort of um, so ideas. So basically what we're saying is the Quran is Islam. context bound. <laughs> okay, I didn't say that, but I, I'm no, but just saying is, like... This is, this is the implication. People need to think about what they're saying then. So but the Quran now is context bound, so I can do whatever what I want. I can drink, I can go out and do whatever the hell I want because the Quran is context bound. But would, like, wouldn't like my kind of line of thinking allude to better? Like the conversation we had a lot earlier was about like knowledge not being just pigeonholed as a sort of you know there's anti-Islamic and Islamic. Like we can take all knowledge from everywhere. So I guess when Jordan Peterson says certain things about something, yes, then but when we you, can take from when it. When you already yeah. have, when you already have something from within our tradition that says the same thing and is directly revealed from God. Why I, I'm reminded of um, the story in the Quran about uh, the Bani Israel, where there was manna and uh, quails coming down from heaven, and they said, oh, we want things from the ground like onions. And Musa alayhi salam says, would you trade that what is better for what is worse? Hmm. This is exactly what this is. The decolonial, obviously now a, a rebuttal would be, well, you're using the decolonial. Where in our history have Muslims been so defeated and colonized? We need something new to deal with this situation because it is unprecedented in 1,400 years. We've always had leadership. We've always had a Muslim great power until uh, the fall of the Khalif. Mm. Yeah? So that's the difference. Yeah. What what would you say then exactly is uh, anti-Islamic about Jordan Peterson specifically, and how does that tie in with the alt right? All the so, right. Jordan Peterson basically takes from um, a well-known Islamophobe, Ayn Hirsi Ali. Uh, I'm sure your uh, listeners know about her, but if they don't, Ayn yeah, Hirsi yeah, Ali is a um, she basically left Islam and she has written a whole lot of books against uh, Islam and Muslims. She's called for the extermination of Muslims. She's called for a whole um, host of things. There's actually a interview on YouTube, if I recall correctly, where he actually talks about uh, talks with Ayan Hirsi Ali about Islam. And I think it's the most that he's ever spoken about Islam, uh, all in one go, at least to my knowledge. And I would suggest that your uh, listeners listen to this interview and then come away and think about what he's said and what Irene Hirsi Ali has said and what he's agreed with as well is the interesting uh, point. Yeah? Uh, obviously, he's also said in the past that he's studied scriptures of all the major religions and that um, I'm paraphrasing now because I can't remember the exact quote. He found a lot of wisdom in Taoism, Christianity, and Judaism, but he struggled to find any wisdom in uh, the Quran or Islam. Which oh, obviously so he's actually has its... said this. I, have, I actually haven't heard this. So he yeah, said it like because word for word. I'm obviously I'm paraphrasing because I can't like yeah. I'm not um, what's the word for eidetic. I can't. Uh, obviously recall exactly what I listened to, but paraphrasing, yes, this is what he said. Um, so it's basically, this. if this is the kind of person that you want to take from, then obviously no one can stop you, but you need to stop and think about how what he's actually saying, it's nothing that, everything that's good in what he's saying, you can take from the Prophet Sallallahu himself. There's nothing and everything beyond that you shouldn't be taking anyway. And would That's you say, 
like his sort of anti-Islamic approach just sort of feeds into, would you say the more alt-right, like would you, would you say the alt-right sort of look up to him or more the right, like maybe... I would say on he's the more... Level of the right, I yeah. think the alt-right have uh, captured him. He's not an unwilling uh, captured person, I should say, or captive, which is the correct word. Um, but I would say, like I mentioned before, Kekistan. The Kekistanis have very much captured him. Okay. In terms of, they've made him an oh. honorary citizen of Kekistan, uh, and he's bas- he basically accepted this live on the Joe Rogan podcast that he did, where they spoke about, again, that's another... Um, like where he talks about his views in a sustained way, uh, you know, above and beyond the, you know, the self-help stuff where he talks about his views in a sustained way is the Joe Rogan podcast that he did. I would again suggest that your listeners listen to that. It's quite long, but it's worth it. Um, just to see like what he thinks about other issues rather than, you know, lobsters and tidying up your room and that kind of stuff. I know I'm kind of pointing at the common kind of memes about him, but yeah, so I would say that you need to look at where is this couched, okay? Again, to use the decolonial example, because obviously someone could say, well, the decolonial is couched in something. The decolonial is couched in a series of South American scholars who basically wished for freedom from Western domination. That's where it's couched. That is easier to convert into something which is Islamic hate than someone who basically agrees with someone else who argues that Islam should be eradicated and Muslims should be eradicated. Mm, that's yeah? actually a good point because that makes sense. Like, um, that's why you'd have like Sam Harris. Actually, I'd not maybe not Sam Harris, but Ayan Hirsi Ali that kind of implicitly or, or actually pretty much explicitly propagates the West is uh, more um, uh, civilized and all that compared oh, to Muslim countries. Ayn so Hirsi it kind of feeds is, into that. Ayn Hirsi Ali is married to uh, Neil Ferguson, who wrote the book Civilization, uh, The Six Collapse of the West. And that book was just completely, it was mind boggling how Orientalist it was. I obviously can't, um, I actually wrote something on it a while back. I might actually publish that. But um, yeah, it's really, I would again suggest for those of your listeners who are interested in knowing what these people think of us, read that book, the civiliz- uh, Civilization book, The Six Killer Apps of the West. Read this book and then come and say, yes, I still want to be right-leaning because it'll completely change your perception of what these people are and what they're doing. So, um, And actually, this is something that I didn't mention uh, in my um, explanation of what the alt-right is. A lot of Muslims who are... Obviously, I'm not talking about um, the more intellectual, quote-unquote, Muslims, but the lay- laity or you know those who don't have the privilege of um, being academics and talking about this stuff for a living. Um, what they are um, seeing the right through is what I, we call the alt-light. The alt-light are basically the gateway drug to the alt-right, who are the actual intellectual... Uh, generators of alt-right discourse okay very few people muslims have read actual alt-right works i would argue that even peterson himself is alt-light he actually is a gateway into more nefarious uh views and more nefarious views of thinking so for example the website that i pointed to your that i pointed your listeners to um earlier countercurrents publishing on there, you have things about race science, how you know skulls can be measured so that certain uh, races are smarter than others, and certain skulls are bigger, and all of this stuff. You know that we saw ended with the Nazis. This is now coming back, and these, there are books being published by this publishing house, Countercurrents Publishing House, which are, I would say, not palatable to Muslim audiences. So. Subhanallah. This needs to be looked at in a very deep way rather than just looking at Peterson and thinking, oh, he says clean your room or be a good person and et cetera, et cetera. When you have that already in your own tradition, why would you overlook your own tradition in order to go to Peterson? Why? And 
and how, how does the because you mentioned alt light um alt right and then you have the alt wallas how how yeah. is that sort of interconnected with that right all that? so I, so i would suggest that the alt wallas are those who basically take on peterson uh other ben shapiro uh mike cernovich all of these figures who basically take on their views and basically propagate them so for example the white sharia article that i um uh what do you mean, that i mentioned there's a certain alt walla who basically wrote an article saying oh look the alt right like sharia now so we're okay kind of thing and this was like the height of ridiculousness because it's stupefying to think that you would think that a his view the Sacco Vandal's view of Islam is correct, and B, it's something to praise that this extreme alt right figure likes Islam. Mm. So it leads to certain alliances being made, which are very, very creepy, I would say actually, yeah. is the best word to describe them. Um uh so I would yeah, argue because that, I think it, and, it 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 uh kind of sorry to add in is that because taking on their perception of Islam is very, very problematic because it's very skewed. It's very oriental in the sense, perhaps, um, mm. it's very, uh, you know, they view it as Islam, just rigid, follow the rules and all that. Yeah, um, basically. And, and we know Islamic, uh, there's so many dimensions, a spiritual dimension, you know, everything like that. So, obviously, they're not aware of the, about the holistic picture of Islam, right? In yeah. how we would define it. They're only kind of viewing it from their own sort of specific yeah. lens. So, it's very um, important to pick up on that sort of differentiation between mm. how we view Islam and how Muslims view Islam and how, I guess, the alt-right views Islam. So, people... Yeah, because some people get confused as well you know, when reading articles and they're like, oh, yeah, he he's a, you know, a pr- propagating Sharia. They think yeah. that it's how they view, but it's not. It's completely different. So, yeah. just wanted to make that distinction as well. Yeah. Um, and something else about the alt wallers, you're now seeing uh, with alt wallers, you see a shift of um, target. So much like their alt right teachers, they're very much anti feminist, like um, excessively so. I would say, like their entire focus is on uh, feminism has ruined Islam. It's led to all of these different things, and therefore, to get rid of all of these ills plaguing Islam, we need to get rid of feminism. And they're very for what um, the alt right call the trad life, the traditional life. Okay. And now, the understanding of traditionalism here is with a capital T, and it comes from two perennialist uh, thinkers, Rene Guénon and Julius Evola. Um, one of whom was an explicit Nazi and the other who basically wrote for Nazi papers for quite an extended period of time. And their views are interesting, to say the least. And to be honest, when uh, Timothy Winter, as he's known, Sheikh Abdulkim Murad, actually praised Julius Avola in a video, you can find this video on YouTube, Riding the Tiger of Modernity, I was shocked. Uh, to be honest, because Evola is one of the main teachers of someone like Steve Bannon and um, Alexander Dugin, who's the advisor to Putin, and we know what kind of chaos Putin is causing in the Middle East at the moment. So these links, they're very creepy. And again, creepy is the best word for this, um, yeah. because as he, as uh, Winter says in the video, he deploys Evola as creating a counterculture to the modern liberal West. That's fine. We want a counterculture. But what counterculture exactly are you propagating when you're propagating Evola, the Nazi? Yeah. Uh, the one who okay. worked for uh, Mussolini. Yeah, black shirt, uh, brown shirt, sorry, and all of that. So you need to think about what you're using and what you're actually doing and how these ideas are actually going to impact on your later understanding of Islam. It might seem useful now to use Evola to quickly get one on the West, as it were, but what impact is that going to have afterwards mm, Yeah, in building our own project? Yeah. It's actually pretty, uh, yeah, it's very... Um what can I term it as like very, we need to be uh, very vigilant, I guess, because yeah. as you said, like, I guess the alt-right do sort of want to propose 
a kind of counter sort of narrative or culture or however to the West. And I guess that's where people will see it as an, uh, aligning with Islam as well. See, and it's important is, to make the distinct, distinction. Yep. Yeah. I would say that the alt-right counterculture and even Evola's counterculture, and we could suggest that they're the same, are rivals to the Islamic counterculture. They are not the same. And they what, are rivals. Would you, would you, what sort of, um, I guess, uh, could you give like a specific example as to how so? Would it because just be the in the sense of, f- yes, yeah, the all right wish to dominate the Muslim. They are the continuation of Westernese and white supremacy and colonization. To, col- mm. to be able to colonize, you need someone to colonize. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we just kind of fall into the, the I guess, the power game of, them yeah, wanting to sort of dominate of us. As well. For example, Trump. Trump, when he came to power, again, not to say that he's an alt right figure, but obviously he's supported by the alt right, argued that uh, he would take the US out of all of these wars. Has he? No. <laughs> well, Just then there words. you go. Then they're still there. Like, and Richard Spencer says, uh, again, this is the founder of. Uh, of the person who coined the term all right, that when we have this white ethno-nationalist state, we'll get rid of all the immigrants, we'll get rid of all the blacks, and they'll go back to Africa, and they'll go back to the Middle East, and we won't attack anybody. I find that hard to believe, simply because the current lifestyle or the current system that the West has set up is dependent upon certain things being the way they are in other places of the world. For example, autocracies in the Middle East to keep the oil flowing, sweatshops in the Philippines and China, et cetera, et cetera, to keep cheap fabrics coming. Do you really think they'd want to lose all of this? Mm. I don't think so. Yeah, it sort of feeds into that. So there's a lot to, yeah, subhanAllah, definitely a lot to think about. Um, We're kind of heading the end of our episode, but yeah. was there any kind of last thoughts you were thinking about in terms of all this that you can kind of um, uh, let our li- uh, listeners know in terms of this everything we talked about today? Sort of like a takeaway um, point or anything? I think the takeaway point is all of this leads back to the grand project that was started in the uh, 19th, 20th century where basically the Islamic world was overtaken by the West. And one thing that I keep harping on about and that I keep saying is that Muslims need to read original Orientalist works. Don't read um, people who are describing them. Go to the works of Hagronia. Go to the works of Golziha. Go to the works of Dinolka. Uh, I'm probably butchering that name. And others. Flaubert as well. Go to these people, read where, when they say, for example, Hagronia in the second volume of his uh, work on the Akhenese, it no longer matters how much of the law of Allah Muslims wish to follow, but how much of it Europe deems compatible with modern life. Read these mm. things, see how, what these people did to your, uh, well, not religion, I would say your way of living. Let's describe it as that, or as my teacher describes it, someone said a language, a discursive language, um, a way of speaking to each other, as it were. Yeah, a sense of community. So I would say that's the final point I would take. Um, Read these works. They're very infuriating uh, for obvious reasons, but read them because you need to know, because the current day alt-right, the current day right wing, even the left, I would say the MSJWs, both of them, what they have in common is this Orientalist view of the Islamic state. Not all Orientalists were right-wing. I would say quite a lot of them were left-leaning. Or mm, what we so describe as left-leaning without before the left came more or less into existence. Yeah, so well, Obviously, you had Lenin in 1917, yeah. but it wasn't, as co- it wasn't the same as it is now, obviously. Yeah? So that would be my yeah. final kind of takeaway. SubhanAllah, those are um, great thoughts, mashallah. It's about, I guess, uh, for people to uh, look a bit deeper into uh, how we perceive Islam. Um, I guess that would be my sort of um, takeover point, just to think things a bit deeper, not just take uh, words for given and sort of Mm -hmm. um, understand uh, where they're coming from and how we can uh, do our best to sort of get to, not, not let our Islam sort of 
be defined by others. So, mm. inshallah, I guess um, the audience can have um, benefit from this um, podcast. Inshallah. I think there was a lot of agreement, also some disagreement as well. But it's about yeah, that's fine. The, <laughs> or, yeah, like it's about getting the audience to sort of um, think, think through, think things through a bit deeper, yeah. and to you know. Uh, assist the Ummah in general. So, Jazakallah yeah. Khair. Um, no is it for coming on Boys in the Cave? It was definitely uh, a very, uh, very, mashallah, very good conversation and would love to have you on sometime because there's a lot more to discuss as well on other yeah, topics. And I know definitely. you've uh, covered a lot of, uh, you've covered a lot of uh, topics uh, as well in other of your work so um, inshallah we'll ha- love to have you back on um, so hope uh, hope you had a go- good conversation as well inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. It was brilliant. It was awesome. Thank you. All right, fantastic. So for our listeners, thank you for give, uh, giving us your attention. If you have any questions or queries, feel free to email us at info at boysinthecave.com or find us on Facebook. And you can follow our journey through Instagram. Um, and also we ha- do have a WhatsApp group. If you sign up on to our $5 Patreon a month, patreon.com slash boysinthecave, you can actually uh, have a chat with us, um, even give us questions that you'd want answered or anything like that. So we'd like to um, get your thoughts. So join us in our, in our WhatsApp group. So for our special guests, Hizar Ali Mira and myself, we wish you the best. This is Tanzan signing off. Assalamualaikum. <laughs>